basketball fans, welcome to another episode of the Nebraska Shootaround Podcast. I'm your host, Jacob Padilla, joining you a little bit later in this week uh, with Nebraska kind of hitting pause and having to push back uh, their games. We decided to wait uh, until we actually had a game to break down before we recorded again. So joining me as always is my co-host, Jacob Bigelow. Biggs, how you doing? Good man, you're uh, making me caffeinate a uh, little, little after dark. But I think we've had some good episodes when we do this after dark thing. So, so here we are. You missed you missed PBA so much. You decided to spend the day there for the for the doubleheader, huh? Yeah, um, stuck around after the men's game for uh, the women's game, and that that one went uh, a lot better than the men's. Shout out to Amy Williams squad, seventy seven forty four win over Wisconsin, who admittedly is not a good team. Uh, I think they were two and six in the big 10 heading into the game and the Huskers just kind of uh, just overpowered them one every single quarter and 20 assists on 33 buckets. Uh, so that's, that's pretty effective uh, team basketball. It was Australia night uh, celebrating their, their, th- their three Aussies on the team. And they played the Australian national anthem before the game and had, had some special decals and everything. Um, apparently, uh, Jazz Shelley's uh, celebrity crush is Devin Booker, which I found out during uh, the game. They had one of those guests the Husker uh, things. So <laughs> I, I already liked her a lot, but uh, obviously she's got good taste. So, um, <laughs> yeah, that, that was, uh, it was a good, a good win for Amy Williams' squad just as they continue to, to play well and Lexus Markowski leading the way once again. I think I saw that Jazz and uh, Ruby Porter's parents made the made the tr- made the uh, day long or so trip over and finally got to got to watch them play in person tonight. And I, I think I, t- I tweeted this during the game, man. Jazz is fun to watch. She's yeah. really she's really fun to watch. Um, she's definitely at the top of the scouting report, you know, for for this team and. Even even on a night where she only has five points, nine boards, nine assists, not bad for a point guard, no matter what game you're talking about. Yeah, and I was sitting next to Steve Mark, uh, who we've had on the show break down this team in the past, and just mentioned like it's it, she is so much fun to watch, and just it's uh, uncanny her ability to just pop up wherever a rebound is. Like she's not some physical uh, force of, of a player. She's what five nine or however tall she is, but somehow. She just is always there for the rebound, wherever it is. And then her passing ability. There was one uh, play where uh, snuck down low, pulled down a board, and then like one dribble and then – or not even dribble, just off the off the board turn and chucked the ball up perfectly past half court, dropped it in the bucket to a teammate who passed it ahead, got a wide open three, just perfect placement. There was another drive where um, she got in the paint, probably could have put up a reverse layup, but instead – um beautiful kind of like sucked the the corner defender in like was looking at the corner just side like no look pass on the money to a a shooter on the wing knocked down a three like um yeah she is uh an absolute blast to watch play basketball she just plays the game differently than a lot of other players you, you see out there Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. So we'll transition to uh, the matinee portion of the doubleheader. Um, Nebraska, the Nebraska men uh, fall to number 11, Wisconsin, 73 to 65 uh, was a familiar script. Um, <laughs> we, we are back here again, referring to something that we have seen many times before. Um, that, that was and, basically the, the theme of my lead in, in the recap. It was like, well, uh, in the words of Scott Frost, same old movie. Yeah, I mean, started off hot. Um, they were going blow for blow with them for about about 10 minutes, a little less than 10 minutes probably yeah. to start the game. Didn't look like they were rusty coming off the pause. Um, even after Trey McGowan's told the media that the most of the positive tests were key guys, um, they looked, they looked, they looked like they came to play um, to start – and then, uh, um, you know, death, taxes, and uh, scoring droughts. Those are the uh, the few guarantees in this Nebraska basketball life. Um, Wisconsin just there, they decided to shoot the lights out from beyond the arc to start the game. First half, they were going, they were going nuts from beyond the arc. Um, again, uh, who else? Very fitting that uh, 
Bellevue West product Chucky Hepburn started him off with the uh, the first basket of the game. He had three three threes in the first half. Uh, Brad Davison, who just loves playing at PBA, uh, he had a thirty point game in Lincoln a couple years ago, and he just started off hot again. Um, and another familiar theme for this Nebraska team, at least for one half, they kept the guy at the top of the scouting report, Johnny Davis, in check. Yeah, uh, and we see it was very similar to the Ohio State game, I thought, except uh, Nebraska didn't didn't hold on to the lead uh, as long in this one, where they kept the the number one guy in check, but then let another guy go off. Difference is this time they they let the second string guy go off. It wasn't some random dude that hadn't done anything all season. Like this is Brad Davis, and you know full well what he's capable of, especially with what he's done against the Huskers in that building time and time again. So while Trey McGowan did a great job and got up, got some help too, where there's one play where Derek Walker and Lapman both kind of got in position, walled up uh, on Davis at the rim, and uh, he kind of just shot the ball right into their hands. Uh, really good defensive play there. Uh, but Trey was the guy uh, on uh, Johnny Davis for most uh, most of the time, and he only played 13 minutes. He picked up a second foul, but got that second foul out, out of frustration because uh, on offense he was trying to hunt for a foul where he thought he got the defender up on uh, up in the air and then tried to jump into him for the foul, but the refs didn't give it to him. And then he went on the other end and tried to reach in for the steal and got whistled for his foul. So he had a, he only played 13 minutes, did not score, missed all five of his shots in the first half. And, and that is credit to Trey McGowan's, but Brad Davison. And I think there was one of, one of the plays was an offensive rebound kick out three where, that's tough. Um, like there's not a whole lot you can do. You just got to get the defensive rebound. Uh, Cause once you're in that kind of scramble broken play situation, there really is no man to man. You just got to react. And sometimes you're just not in position uh, to, to defend a shot. But a um, couple of the others were just defensive lapses um, where, you know, the one thing that you can't let happen is for this guy to get hot from three. And that's what I pointed out. Um, you start with, with Johnny Davis, and then number two is uh, Brad Davison and not let him get open look from three. And there was one where I think it, Lat got switched onto him and was just kind of slow to, to close out. He just um, he gave Davison too much space, and Davison just rose up and knocked down a three. Um, contest was way late. Uh, it didn't matter. And then there was another one where uh, just kind of – not reacting to him just he, he just got too many easy looks and they, they were because of defensive lapses there's one where they did a good job of running him off a screen and i think bryce got picked off and there was no no adjustment no reaction to it uh he just got a clean look nobody else helped him out uh, just no communication on the play um so a, a lot of what davison hit in, in the first half he had five threes in the first half scored 17 points and they, they were largely uncontested and just go kind of the frustration of the season where you can do some things really well. You can do some things well enough to win a game, but you can't do everything well enough to win. And that is the theme of this Nebraska season. And we saw it again in, in that first half, especially with, with Davison. I think in the first half, they also would they give up like nine offensive rebounds in the first half. Um, pretty sure Wisconsin – was like only had like four made twos in the first yeah, half as well. Um, <laughs> just, just if you look at, if you coming into this game, you say, oh, they're going to hold Johnny Davis scoreless for a half and Wisconsin's only going to have four makes from two. You probably like your chances, but then you see what happened on the offensive end for Nebraska where things went south in a hurry. Yeah. Okay, so I went through and crunched the numbers on this. Nebraska, so Kobe Webster hit a three to give Nebraska the lead at, at 21-20. All right, that's, uh, that's where we're at, 21-20 lead after Kobe Webster three. In the next, 10, or next 19 minutes and 47 seconds of game time, so almost an entire half uh, of game time, they shot four of 28 from the field five or six from the free throw line and turn the ball over five times in nearly 20 minutes they made four shots 
That's the first <laughs> I, time. That's the first time I've heard those numbers. Yeah. I, um, I, I wish the listeners could see the look on your face. Cause uh, we, we talked about this before uh, the pod, before we started recording, I asked you if you wanted to know them going in or if you want to give your reaction live. And I'm glad you decided to give the reaction live. Cause man, that, that I, your face that, summed it up perfectly. That is, that is painful to hear more turnovers than mid shots in yep. 20 minutes. Yes. That is almost impressive in a way. Yeah. <laughs> so <it> is... <laughs> they were three of 15 uh, with one trip to the line and three turnovers to end the first half. And then they opened the second half with a dunk for a man on a broken play um, and then missed their next 12 shots. Uh, and made to, Bryce drew two fouls and hit all four of the free throws and then turned it over twice. Um, so they did not get their second field goal until the uh, 10.50 mark, basically, of the second half. And that, uh, boys and girls, is how you lose a basketball game. Yeah, even with the little mini second half rally, uh, they were down 18, I think, was the biggest deficit. Yeah. Tried to tried to claw back, um, and a rally sparked by both the McGowan's brothers, mostly Bryce, but Love Trey yeah. co- Trey contributed too. Um, uh, Love and zero run, uh, eight from Bryce and uh, three from Trey with a, a bucket and one free throw, split a pair, um, and Bryce hit two threes, including one from the FNBO logo. Um, that uh, was pretty impressive shot. He. Uh, Bryce ended up finishing with 23 points on seven of 14 shooting three of seven from three and six of six from the line, uh, four boards, zero assists and two turnovers. Um, so uh, again, that it seems like he's struggled to, to find the kind of, uh, he's shown playmaking ability uh, early in the season, especially after Trey went down, he had that nice little stretch where he was getting three to four assists a game. But more often than not, it seems like that he just hasn't looked to use that part of his game. Uh, but still, 23 points on 50% shooting, you'll take that every single game. Unfortunately, they've got four points on two of six shooting from Derek Walker. Uh, four assists, but two turnovers before he fouled out. Um, that's just that's one of Derek's worst scoring games of the season. Uh, I, I, don't, I can't think like, – and not looking at his uh, – is the game logs right now, but can't imagine there are many games this year, considering how efficient he's been, where he had more shot attempts and points. Um, Trey is still kind of working his way back and as big of an impact as he had defensively. He scored four points, only made one shot, uh, which came during that rally that we talked about. Um, but um, yeah, and they, they got nine points from Kobe Webster off the bench. Um, Lap may end. <sighs> He got that dunk and then knocked down two threes, but kind of he also missed the rim entirely on two layup attempts. They threw it off the backboard um, and had, had, had a turnover that was kind of kind of rough as well. Um, and Alonzo Verge Jr., he had a decent 11 points on four of eight shooting in the first half and or nine points on four of eight shooting in the first half. And then... He did not – he had one bucket in, in the second half, uh, I believe. Um, so that, that, that was rough. Uh, he finished 5 of 12 from the, the field, and Hoiberg basically sat him for the last nine minutes and change of the game. Yeah, he went with Kobe down the, down the stretch. Um, and then who else but to have two uh, big-time steals down the stretch to kind of qual the run and put the game on ice and – Little cherry on top with a dunk. Yeah. Uh, Chucky Hepburn. Um, the, just the doing, of, just yeah. doing what, what we've seen him do for so long. Um, it was good to see him uh, start the game off with it. He, he started the game off, and in a way, he kind of ended it too. Um, Bryce McGowan hits the three in garbage time for uh, the backdoor cover for some of you out there who uh, took advantage of the uh, – spread going up to nine and a half when Tyler wall was declared active like myself, but that's for another time. Um, but yeah, Chuck started the game and he ended it and um, get, dealing with some, uh, some personal uh, tragedy this week, uh, losing a very close friend uh, in a, in a, tra- in a 
tragedy here in town on Monday, uh, playing with a heavy heart with a bunch of people in attendance and just doing like I like, just Chucky Hepburn doing Chucky Hepburn things from start to finish in this game. Yeah, and our, co- our condolences definitely go out to uh, the family of Vince Burton's and um, obviously the Hepburn family is uh, among them. Um, playing again with a heavy heart, like you said, and he said it, w- it was tough for him on Monday early in the week, kind of when he learned the news and someone he's been very close to, uh, but his teammates helped him through it. And once he got out there on the court, uh, he had nice, he <laughs> said he didn't notice it, but he had a nice uh, welcome uh, round of applause when they announced him during the starting lineup. I think he said he had, uh, he, he had 28 tickets that he gave out to friends and family. And I'm sure there were, uh, plenty of others that were there that were, were um, happy to see him do well and cheering him on uh, when they had the opportunity. So you mentioned start of the game with a three, first possession. Nebraska actually defended them really well. Wisconsin got run, run down to the end of the shot clock and then get the ball to Chucky, three on the clock, just kind of rises up and knocks down a, a deep three in uh, Verge's face. And you're like, oh, here we go. And Knocked down, uh, finished with 13 points, uh, hit three threes, um, got that dunk late. Um, just r- real solid game for Chucky. Hit some big-time shots there. And uh, you mentioned defensively, uh, he, he got those two clutch steals that kind of helped them seal it because uh, Nebraska made a game of it. They got it. That 11-0 run cut the game down to seven points with like six and change to go. So that they made it a game again. And then immediately Johnny Davis ended the run with a pair of free throws and then back-to-back steals from Chucky and hit Davis for a layup on the first and then took the other uh, for, for a dunk himself, like you mentioned. So just, I mean, Chucky Hepburn doing what we've, seen, we've been watching him do for five years now, uh, just making clutch plays, coming up big when his team uh, needs him. Uh, and uh, I was happy for him that he was able to, have a good game back here in front of friends and family and uh, knowing what he had gone through this week. You could tell his team was happy too. You could oh, tell yeah. Co- uh, Coach Guard as well. I saw the Wisconsin basketball account post a video saying that that was, that, that was for you for, with uh, Coach Guard yeah. walking off the court, giving Chuck a pat on the back. And, uh, yeah, you know, and of naturally with a, uh, with a local product coming back to play against the local school, there was uh, some chatter this week about uh, Chucky's recruitment, um, the recruitment of local uh, talent in the state of Nebraska, uh, and some interesting comments. Uh, Jimmy Watkins from the World Herald will give him will give him credit. Yeah. Um, wrote a, a good wrote, story. Go read. Wrote it. A, yeah, wrote a good story. Good read about uh, about Chucky's return, and then kind of segued into Nebraska's perspective. Well. Matt Abdelmassi's perspective on uh, on the on recruiting in general, as well as local, as it relates to in-state kit. Yeah, um, I'll go ahead and read the quote here. Um, it, it, so, with all due respect to the kids that have been in-state, I feel like the kids that we have added are quality players in their own right. I think it would be a major concern if you were not getting in-state kids, and then also not getting any quality talent from outside the state. I don't think it has anything to do with approach. I feel pretty strong that our approach must be working with the kids that we have added in our program. Um, so a lot of people are, I, I think a lot of people around here are focused on the um, kind of the comparing local kids to uh, kids outside the state or whatever. And, um, it's obviously not great when you've got an in-state kid come back that, <clears throat> and I, I think we can say th- this, um, I don't think we're stepping overstepping our bounds here. That that was a deal where yes, they got in late, but I, I feel Nebraska definitely had a better chance to to get back in it with Chucky. I think than they ended up um, kind of pushing for um, from kind of what I've heard, and I think you've heard the same. Just, yes, yes, um, definitely. They, and I also and I also had kind of a front row seat to when yeah. Nebraska made their. Oh, yeah their biggest inroads with not only Chucky, but with, with the in-state recruiters. And that's a big credit to, to Mike, Michael Lewis, um, former assistant under, under 10 miles now at uh, UCLA with Mick Cronin. And um, I'm pretty sure, pretty sure you wrote, you wrote the story on it when, uh, when Lou became the guy, uh, the point man for, for Nebraska kids. And that was kind of, that was kind of a, a big turning point locally for, the perspective on on playing for Nebraska and for that for Coach Miles and that staff, and then of course you know 
I think Chucky was quoted in the story as saying that there was a point where he was 85 percent sure that he was going to go play for Nebraska, that he was going to play for Nebraska after saying that if you ask his younger self that would be never he never thought he'd, he'd play there uh, and, I, I think um, he talked about uh Creighton being his dream school uh, in a previous story uh because obviously the Jays uh, recruited him early and, and went after him as well and then ended up signing Ryan Nemhard. so um kind of one different different uh uh different path there but again it's a kid grew up in omaha um with i think bellevue west obviously has strong uh history of players going to creating specialty point guards and doing well there um so he kind of grew up with that so um but like you mentioned uh nebraska did a really good job and i i talked to michael lewis um about him and he uh he he absolutely loved chucky and he he he, he called him basically a, a pied piper that he thought like you get Chucky, then you're going to have a, a leg up on every other kid that comes up with him, which would obviously be Hunter Salas, and then behind him as well. And we've seen the Jason Greens and Isaac Trouts um, rise to national prominence and um, become high major prospects in their own right. And he thought, you land Chucky, then you've got a great shot because uh, Chucky just has that kind of personality. Everybody knows Chucky. Everybody loves Chucky. And he just says that gravi- like people gravitate or, uh, to him. And um, so that's, that was kind of their plan at that point. Go get Chucky. Uh, and then y- you feel good about your chances with Hunter Salas and anybody else and some of these other guys that have come along since. Yeah. And I mean, I think that's where Wisconsin fans like first fell in love with him was his, his presence on social media after committing to Wisconsin and his, his, you know, peer recruiting of, you know, these other guys, you'd always see him replying to guys getting offers from Wisconsin or commenting on guys having visits to Wisconsin. I mean, he was, he was all in from the jump and uh, you know, that could have, like you said, the Pied Piper. I mean, that, that is definitely what uh, coach miles, staff viewed him as. And he was, I mean, he was a big priority for, for Lou and for, for miles. I mean, they were in constant contact with them pretty sure i mean i'm pretty sure chucky still has a has a relationship with with uh, coach miles i mean they both you know they're still fr- they're still friendly with each other but then obviously uh things have changed things changed after that that 18 19 season and in the transition um you know some some i mean he was he wasn't the only one who uh, even he wasn't even the only one locally who the the perspective of you know, his recruitment changed um, and I don't want to say got lost in the shuffle, but I mean, that's kind of in hindsight, yeah. what happened? I think they, they prioritized other guys. Um, I think that's as simple as it And they did, I mean, the, the, the staff went up and visited him during, when the, the, the period opened up and it wasn't like they didn't recruit him, period. Um, so they definitely, they, they tried to stay involved with it. But again, I think ultimately they probably, like some other guys better um, and didn't necessarily go full out and put out the, the, the kind of the full on blitz um, to, to really make Chucky feel comfortable about the the program under the new leadership. And um, it, and obviously Chucky is kind of the, the story, the, the main point here, but I I think the second half of that uh, quote or the last part there is kind of what I'm struggling with and what I, I, and to be fair, like w- what is Abdelmasi supposed to say when asked about this specifically? Uh, like if he's going to answer it, like he can't say, uh, yeah, well, we were wrong. Uh, the guys that we got aren't any good. And uh, we definitely should have went uh, went after these guys or whatever to stand or whatever. Yeah, he's not going to, he's not going to one, he's not going to throw his players under the bus. Yeah. Two, he's not going to throw himself under the bus because yes. it is his, it is his job. And depending on who you ask his job only yes. to go out and put this roster together and decide who they're going to target and who's going to do what and this, that, and the other thing. And thirdly, he's not going to throw his boss, good friend and head coach under the bus. Well, but wait, wait, let me, I'm going to push back on that last one because uh, I'll re- reread the quote here. I don't think it has anything to do with approach. I feel pretty strong that our approach must be working with the kids that we have added in our program. All right. So if you've landed really good kids and your approach is working, then how do you explain the, the results, right? Like if, yeah. if, if the recruiting isn't the problem, then it has to be the coaching, right? 
So, yeah, that's obviously Fred. One, one would think. Yeah, so, one, one would think. Yeah, yeah. so that, 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 that's my issue with there. The, 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 the approach is the problem. And the way they built this roster is the problem. And in some cases, talent identification is the problem. And it seems like, like Hoiberg's obviously spoken highly of Chucky. And, I mean, he got to see him firsthand. I, I, he was there when uh, Pius went through the Thunderdome last year, and he was up there in the stands. I, I, I was there, too, and uh, Chucky just kind of took over. And I think we were there. We were, we were at that game together, yeah, actually. Yeah, exactly. I mean, um, and Fred, you know, Fred's been watching Chucky in a way since he was a kid because yeah. Chucky, Chucky probably crossed paths with, his, with Fred's twins in the, you know, in – summer ball or whatever for for years when they when they were when they were living in Ames and he was at Iowa State and, you know the close proximity they probably they probably played they probably played against one another a handful of times throughout the years I mean definitely you know Fred Fred definitely knew who Chucky Hepburn was he was and he, so but ultimately it seems like he kind of defers and I, I that's one thing I really would love to see kind of what the their process is in terms of evaluation and signing off, right? Who are we going to go after and all that? Uh, but it really does seem like Hoiberg kind of really defers to Abdelmasi in, in these matters. And you kind of wish maybe um, that they could get more perspectives in there, more voices that matter uh, because kind of the way things have worked out, like again, this, this roster just doesn't fit together well enough in order to win games in the big 10. And um there, there's some intangible things there, and then there's just some like basic skill sets and physical traits where things don't don't click. Um, so they just build a roster that has almost no uh, margin for error, and that's what we see in this game where they played really solid basketball for for stretches, but they weren't able to sustain that. And when things go bad, they 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 go really bad at, at times for this team. And e- even with that, it's still uh, an eight-point loss against a top-15 team. Like, it's not like they are getting run off the court, getting embarrassed. It's just they have too many lapses to, to, to win these games. It's the same old thing. Uh, they, they've played out this game so many times this season already. It's just It just comes down to they're, they're not talented enough to beat teams w- with talent. And – so they have to win with execution and they can't execute for 40 minutes. Yeah. I mean, I've, you know, what the, what do they say? The definition of insanity is trying to do the same thing over and over again and yep. seeing, seeing similar results. I mean, I had that thought today, man, like, you know, the, the, the optimistic view going into this game was, you know, maybe, you know, a layoff, you know, but, their positive cases, they were all asymptomatic. You know, maybe they tried to, when they could get everyone together, maybe they, maybe they want to try something new. Maybe there's, even if it's one little thing, maybe they want to try something different. Nope, not really. It looked, I mean, I don't, you know, they, they talk, they, they've talked about, you know, the biggest thing that they talked about wanting to do was getting Derek involved. And then they said, you know, oh, we've got this week long layoff between games. We're going to try to switch up the offense. Has the offense really changed that much to you? Uh, so a, a little bit. Uh, they are getting Derek more touches. They, they forget about him less, I think, is how I'll put that. They forget about involving him less than they used to. Um, but I mean, like you're not going to change, you're not going to scrap the entire offense and start over midseason. Um, so it's just more of an emphasis thing and maybe starting every possession where you bring him up to the high post and, and get the ball instead of going directly into a ball screen or ISO or whatever um, we saw a lot of. So um, there, there definitely are some, but then there are stretches where they go right back into the same old thing where it's just whoever brings the ball up is going to go try to do something. And, and that's what, and that's what, and that's what kickstarted that drought. That's yeah. what kickstarted that drought today. Uh, and I mean, Bryce called it static. Like they just kind of got static. They, they fell back into that trap again for whatever reason. Uh, it just, it, it continues to happen where, um, and, and it's, it, it's on the guy with the ball and then it's on everybody else as well for not, I mean, they kind of fall into the trap as well. Like we're just going to watch him go to work. Um, it, the cutting isn't good. Uh, the off ball uh, the screens aren't solid guys. The guys don't, and something, uh, pardon me for mentioning Crane here, but it's something that uh, that 
like Coach Mack and over in his program that they really stress and focus on. And you always hear about playing fast and playing with tempo. And typically you think of like the open court and that's part of it. But Creighton really tries to play fast within the half court as well. And what that is, is you are cutting hard. You're, you're really crisp with your ball movement, with your man, uh, your men spacing the floor. Guys are in the right spots. Uh, nobody's just kind of going through the motions. And that's how you create advantages. And that's something that Creighton's struggling with at, at times too, as you saw in their loss to, to Butler. But it's something that Nebraska just isn't very good at either. Um, again, being able to play fast and getting shots, uh, getting early shot clock opportunities and all that isn't just on a guy running the floor after a stop. It's about doing your job, whether that creates a, a look for yourself or for your teammates and make things easier. And we just don't often have five guys involved on an offensive possession. Um, and, and that's where you can get into these, the, these droughts because at this point we know these guys aren't good enough to consistently win the way they're playing. Alonzo Verge isn't good enough to go finish if teams are really keying in on him. Um, Bryce McGowan is still kind of figuring things out in terms of um, creating good looks. And they, they got a lot of other guys that just are, are limited. And that's kind of where they are right now. Yeah. And that, like you said, I mean, that comes back to the construction of the roster. And yes, they've had their, they've had their bouts with bad injury luck with, you know, Trey missing 15 games and, and losing Wilhelm Breidenbach for the year. I mean, I thought, I thought, during the game today that they could, that Wilhelm would have been very useful today, um, you know, and, and that, you know, I think, I mean, today, today was a game where I thought, where I just, I, you know, we haven't talked about this since the start of the year, but I mean, looking at their Ken Palm page, their lowest ranked, their lowest ranked statistic in the country is uh, they are in the bottom six in offensive rebound percentage they rank 351 out of 357 in offensive rebound percentage which means they are allowing a ton no that means they're grabbing none at all they're getting like none they're getting none my bad well stats that's what what makes even worse is they're allowing a ton as well Uh, yeah they're they're, allowing a ton and getting none (laughs) so and this actually that is they lost the possession battle um and and nebraska did not get killed in any one area of the game against wisconsin wisconsin just beat them by a little bit in each of the areas because like you you talk about the offensive rebounds and it was 13 to 2 but wisconsin only scored seven second chance points on uh, those 13 offensive rebounds. And I know Hoiberg and Bryce talked about, oh, uh, it felt like a lot of Wisconsin's threes came after offensive rebounds. And they only made one of those threes that they got off their, an offensive rebound because they got two of those putbacks right away during the start. Um, so it may have felt like they got a lot of open threes, but only one of Brad Davison's three came off of an offensive rebound kickout. Um, so Nebraska did a good job of limiting uh, Wisconsin's second chance offense. But that takes a lot of energy out of you. And when you have to defend two and three possessions on one trip down the floor, that leaves you with that much less off or energy to go use on the other end. And it just really demoralizes you when you have to keep uh, competing uh, mul- through multiple shot attempts on a possession. So you look at points in the paint, 30 to 26 Wisconsin, slight edge. Um, fast break, 14 to nine, slight edge. Second chance, seven to three, slight edge. Um, Wisconsin hit 10 threes, Nebraska hit seven. So that's, that, that really was kind of the difference there. Um, and uh, free throws were almost even. Nebraska was plus one in, in made free throws. So it really did come down to Wisconsin. Uh, I mean, turnovers were 13 to 10. So again, slight edge. Uh, points off those uh, were equal though. Um, so it, Wisconsin got ended up uh, basically with 13 more shot attempts. So even though Nebraska defended pretty well, uh, eventually they're going to make shots. And Wisconsin was able to make enough shots um, to, to where uh, they were able to, to get the lead and, and hold on to it. Yes, yeah. and, they, and they, had a, they had a pretty balanced attack, you know, four of their five starters and, and double figures. Uh, Tyler Wall, who came back from an ankle injury that kept him out of their loss to Michigan State, 
non uh, he had 10 boards, but you know, scoring scoring the ball, not I mean one of five. But I mean Tyler Wall, he's more of a he's more of a just his presence makes a difference. You know, he's 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 a guy who could easily get lost in a scouting report, but you know, he, 10 boards, that's that's impressive. But another form and I kind of forgot Ben Carlson's at Wisconsin. Yep. That's another former uh, that's another former Tim Miles recruit yep. who I got to interact with a couple times. But um yeah, man. I mean, there's not really much else to say in regards to to this game. Uh, you know, Trey being back in the starting lineup means we saw almost no Kese Tomonaga. He only yep. played nine minutes, only only took one shot. Um, you know, just I mean, yeah, like we led off with. I mean, it's something we've seen far too many times before. Uh, next game up Saturday at 5:30 against a team that ran you off of their floor in Rutgers. Um, that's a Rutgers was the last uh, last Big Ten win for Nebraska last March, where they kind of just decided to have everything click out of nowhere and beat them by 20. Um, so, who really knows what to expect? I'm looking at this ESPN BPI. Um, it says. Says Nebraska has a forty six point two percent chance to win. So, who knows what and, <laughs> what could what could possibly go wrong? And that's kind of Nebraska is entering that like the second half of this the schedule here is loaded with a lot more of the kind of more middle tier to to lower end uh, of the Big Ten teams. A uh, lot of but, favorable home games yeah, the rest of the way. A they, lot of favorable home games they have to start taking advantage of these because if they don't, if they continue to let these games slip away, these games where they have a chance to win, they do well enough in certain areas, uh, but they can't get the final score to go their way, then this thing could get really bad. Um, and it's already not very good. Um, <laughs> it's not, it's already not very good. Yeah. Uh, morale is not very high. Um, we are, uh, so we, it, uh, I, I will say it was kind of interesting. I, I noted, uh, so we, we talked to Bryce and Trey on uh, – and Kobe kind of mentioned it too, uh, but uh, talked to Bryce and Trey before this game, and they were asked again about kind of the Kobe Webster comments, and uh, they, they both mentioned like how many games were left in the season. Uh, and they're like, like, we got these 12 games uh, left at least here. We're just focusing on these games and doing what we can and all that. Like, it's probably not good that you're focusing on how many games you have left already at this point. Yeah, if you're counting the, down to the end of the year, yeah. no, not, <laughs> a, not ideal yeah. at all. Um, and, and, I mean, way, like, and, and that's kind of the way I felt. But even if you're like, all right, this is all we have left. Like we got to take advantage of every chance we get to, to get out here and play. It's still like it, you only have 12 games left. All, uh, we're already at that point and they still don't have a big 10 win. So no matter how, you look at that, it, it, it's not great for the, the current situation. Yeah, I mean, they haven't won a game since December 22nd against Kennesaw State. I mean, that feels like forever ago. Uh, I mean, the the straight. the morale and everything coming from, from the team, not great. Uh, obviously, the atmosphere today wasn't going to be great with a 4 o'clock tip on a Thursday afternoon due to the reschedule, but – I mean, this could, I mean, it's already like, it's already off balance, but I mean, if this continues, it's going to be more than sideways. It might be upside down. I mean, this, uh, the, this was their year to try to, you know, have something to sell. Um, And I know we've talked about this, you know, you're probably going to write about it at some point. Sorry. But uh, I mean, this was their year, this was their year to, to to have something to sell, not just nationally, not just to recruits, but but to the fan base who, you know, belief in what they're trying to do is is dwindling very much so. And if you know, they need they need some kind of break or divine intervention or a win, you know, something, something positive that would help in any way, shape or form at this point, a win, a single win. (laughs) Yep. One single win. When, when Fred Hoiberg was hired here, we thought the one single win that mattered would be happening in March, 
not in year three where they're six and 14 and zero for nine in the league and they need one single win. And that's the, the frustrating, the, the, I think probably the most frustrating part for Nebraska fans is they sit back and see all these other cellar dwellers in the big 10. Occasionally they pull an upset. They win a game. Northwestern beats uh, whoever they beat. I forgot already. It was Michigan, Michigan State, State at the yeah. Breslin center. They almost beat them twice. Uh, like <laughs> they pulled off that win. Like, um, like no, Nebraska just hasn't been able to do that. Um, it's like they, they, they're losing every game that they're supposed to lose. They're just, they, they can't find a way to, to pull off an upset. They find ways to lose instead of the, the, uh, the opposite. And uh, other teams like, like Northwestern's not a good team, but again, they, they found a way to get that win. Nebraska has not found a way to do that. And I'll, I'll tie this back to kind of the, the Hepburn discussion and the, the, Abdel Masi quotes and like I said, the kind of like our our approach is fine. We're landing good kids. That's like again, like I you can point to the again the the highly touted class, twenty twenty one highest rated for class class ever. Um, you're getting oh the, the top ranked JUCO big man for this twenty twenty two class. Um, you can point to individual recruiting wins. Obviously, um, Bryce McGowan's with a huge recruiting win. One, they're not going to be getting a Bryce McCowan, McGowan's every uh, every class or every other class, or who knows if they'll ever get another one again. They tried uh, to do the five star brother thing again yeah. and fail. Correct. So. Uh, <laughs> and so you mentioned like this was their opportunity to kind of do something with this class, and because of misses, and I talked with someone recently, like it's the not this twenty twenty one class, it was kind of the twenty twenty class, and the guys they brought in there. Um, that they, they've, they've got no contributors left basically like Kobe Webster is like the only guy left from that class. Uh, and, and like lat and lat man is still like from that class too. Um, and neither one of those guys have given you enough, uh, in, in order to win this season. And so like the problem is not that they can't land top end guys it's that they can't fill out a roster with big 10 level uh, competitors, uh, guys that can play and, and make a difference at the Big Ten level. It, like Bry- Bryce McGowan's, I think, in, in another situation, situation w- would be pretty darn good. Like he could be on a winning team and would, would improve and still be able to put up some 20 point games and all that if he had a better supporting cast around him. Um, like Nebraska's got a, a lot of these guys on this team could be useful pieces on a winning team. But as role they, players, yes, uh, yeah, for the most part, as role players, but they just don't fit together, and guys aren't good enough in their roles for the reasons they were brought in, and their weaknesses kind of overlap and intensify and, and magnify each other. And the result is a team that can't get a win in the Big Ten, uh, despite probably having their most talent of Hoiberg's three years in Lincoln like just raw talent, but at the same time, some of these guys. They, they aren't as talented as maybe those recruiting rankings would say. It's clear at this point. Like a guy like uh, Keon Edwards was a top 100 recruit over a four-star guy, and he's unplayable right now. Like, so you, you can, in the offseason, you can point to that him as a big part or to that recruiting class of the transfer and um, all this, but he's not helping you. And unfortunately, the injury, because uh, Wilhelm Breidenbach, he can't help you now. That's kind of a different story, but um, just there aren't enough guys that that actually – are high level big 10 players on this team. And um, again, the, the, the weaknesses kind of, they, they pile up and uh, they, they don't build each other up. So that is the problem with their process right now. Um, they, whether, I don't know if it's a, if, is it an evaluation problem? Is it, these are the best that they can get? Or are they just not able to land players that are good enough? Um, what, like, I would love to know what, like, what causes like what are what are the what are the green flags that they see for like this is a guy we want to go after this guy this guy fits our program this guy fits our system this guy fits our vision like what what are they looking for that like makes guys stand out to them yeah, i mean so- you talk you talk about uh, you talk about seeing these, uh, you know, the cellar dwellers doing well. How about, how about the other Big Ten schools with with first year coaches, or coaches that have been here? Or co- like, you've got you've got another former NBA coach, coaching in Bloomington, Indiana, and that hire got clowned. That hire got memed, clowned, laughed at 
by the Big Ten, by college basketball as a whole. And what did they do last week? They beat their biggest in-state rival for the first time in six years. They had lost nine in a row. You look at Minnesota. Yep. You, who who was all the talk around when going into their, you know, who were they going to hire? Craig Smith, Nico Megved, Brian Dutcher, Ben Johnson? <laughs> Who's this? And they and they're and they're you know, they're 11 and 6. They have as many losses as Nebraska has wins. Michael Shrewsbury at Penn State, another guy who came who has an NBA background. He came into Penn State, one of the one of the one of the biggest sleeper not sleeper sleepy jobs and atmospheres in in power basketball they're all winning more games yeah that's yeah that, i mean that, that's where we're at right now in, in year three and it, it's like like i i like a guy like casey tomanaga i see why they like i i've seen the synergy numbers and what he did at juco and i can see how you can think like all right, we, we can find a way to make this guy useful uh, in the way that we play. I, I don't know how you watch. The problem is I don't know how you see what he does well and what he doesn't do well, and then also think, yeah, he'll fit with Kobe Webster and with C.J. Wilcher and with Lat Mayen and with Bryce McGowan's. Like, oh, yeah, that'll definitely work together. Like, that's the problem. Like, they don't have enough guys that complement each other and oh, absolutely and because of uh kind of poor evaluation um and what again whether it's poor evaluation or simply not being able to land the guys that would have made it work um that's i think i mean i think of, kind of, i think of two big misses you know i think of two big misses yep. where the the vibes were they had they had these guys guys and that's and that's Adama Sonogo and and Carter Witt and they were those were within what a month of each other that those two guys were you know they were down to you know Nebraska was either in a final two or a final three um Sonogo has done nothing but improve at UConn he's one of the better interior big men in the country and what is and what is the biggest thing that Nebraska's lacking yeah. <laughs> um Carter Witt he reclassified. He wound up at Wake Forest earlier than expected. He's kind of not, not in a big role, but I mean, he's a point guard. He, he's struggling. <laughs> um, but Chucky Hepburn, uh, I mean, I think that there would probably be a little bit of overlap with Trey McGowan and, and Chucky uh, Hepburn in, in terms of um, like what they do well and kind of what some of their limitations are. Uh, and Trey getting hurt kind of makes this not fair, but like the entire time you were seeing them play without Trey, you're thinking like, well, they really could use a guy that can defend and a guy that knows the game and, and a, guy a pass first point ball, guard moves the ball. Well, <laughs> um, and a guy that's really going to compete. And like, that's ba I'm wait, I'm, I'm basically describing Chucky Hepburn, aren't I? Um, <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> um, it, yeah, it's just, it's just tough. It just too too many misses on the recruiting trail, and so that's why a, a comment like "Oh, our recruit, our, our process is fine. We've been landing good kids" uh, just rubs me the wrong way and kind of ma makes it tough to, to to feel optimistic about this thing turning around. And again, part of that is because this was supposed to be the year where things came together, and somehow they they've been worse th than previously uh, than previous years. So, um, yeah, I, I think. We, we probably don't need to rant on this any longer. We've, uh, no. we've said plenty. <laughs> um, so I, I think we'll, we'll cut it off here. Uh, we just crossed, we crossed over into Friday here um, as we record this. So uh, I think in the meantime, we, we've got another quick turnaround game on Saturday. So hopefully you will have listened to this before uh, tip off for that one. And uh, we will kind of, I think we'll, probably get back to recording on our normal schedule get get a wednesday uh, recording in to kind of go out uh, thursday morning or uh, at least maybe wednesday night yeah uh, yeah rutgers but, on rutgers on saturday michigan on tuesday so yeah. if we go back to regularly scheduled programming we'll have we'll have two games to talk about and uh and we can we can do what we've wanted to do all year look into north Western going into next weekend. Look into look into Pete Nance and Boo Booey going into next weekend at PBA. Just where we thought this season would be. 
at this time, right? <laughs> yeah, boy. Anyway, in, in the meantime, uh, stay tuned to hellvarsity.com. I'll, ha- I'll have some stuff coming there as usual. Can, can continue to follow Steve Mark's coverage of the women's team as they, uh, as they continue to play well uh, and I think make Nebraska fans proud. And you can follow me on Twitter at Jacob Adilla underscore. You can follow Biggs at the underscore Bigelow. And we will talk at you again next week. A Huda Media Production.